Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this afternoon's uh, Fusenic Literature uh, Symposium. My name is Frank Salani. Uh, I'm the uh, professor of near recent studies and the chair of the Department of Slavic and Eastern Languages and Literatures. And I'm happy to uh, welcome you to this afternoon's event. Uh, before getting started, I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize uh, the Boston College units and persons who have made uh, this gathering possible this afternoon. Specifically, I would like to thank the uh, uh, Boston College Institute for the Liberal Arts, the Boston College uh, Jewish Studies Program, the Boston College uh, East European Studies Program, my home uh, department, the Department of Slavic and Eastern Languages and Literatures, uh, and Professor Maxim Schreier, the Eminence Grise behind uh, this symposium. Uh, we have a full schedule and a very richly textured uh, uh, topic to deal with uh, and not enough time to give it uh, its due. So I'm going to keep my opening remarks to a uh, bare minimum. But I must begin by telling you how uh, privileged uh, I feel to be given this task of convening this symposium, presenting this afternoon's uh, speakers, and introducing Dr. David Schreier Petrov, in whose honor is this symposium is being uh, given. Uh, we're here today to celebrate Dr. Schreier Petrov's work, but also to mark the American publication of his novel, Dr. Levitin the first in Dr. Shreya Petrov's trilogy of novels dealing with the struggle of uh, Soviet Jewry and the plight of Refuseniks. At uh, first blush, you might ask uh, why the odd choice of a New Easternist uh, introducing a symposium on Refusenik literature. What does a Catholic boy like me from <laughs> Eastern Mediterranean, whose area of specialization is primarily uh, Near Eastern Christians, uh, what do I have to do with Russian Jewry, the plight of Russian Jews, and Refusenik literature? Fair questions. Uh, I grew up in Lebanon in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Many of you who are from here, from New England, know many Lebanons. I come from the real one, on the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, my, my political memory, I think, began in the late 1960s, early 1970s, in my grandparents' home in Christian East Beirut. Uh, my paternal grandfather was a, uh, um, a vice cop. He was a detective, a vice detective. He was retired at the time, uh, but visiting my grandparents' home, um, I think it was around the late 60s, early 70s, um, I came to meet over the next couple of years a few dozen um, new relatives whom I had never met in my life. But I was told those were our relatives uh, from Syria. They spoke in, in a weird Lebanese accent. Um, and that, that was a story that was given, that those were Syrian relatives. And every few months, those relatives would change. They were mainly male. Um, uh, they would never come out of, you know, was, I was six, seven, eight years old at the time. They would never come out to play in the garden. They always stayed inside the house. And um, over the weeks, their appearance changed. Uh, they grew beards. And over a period of a few months, they disappeared. And they were refreshed by a brand new batch of new relatives, also from Syria. I told you this is a great story. Um, I came to find out later, after my grandfather's passing in the late 70s, um, that those were Syrian Jews, and that my grandfather was involved in the smuggling of Syrian Jews out of Syria into Lebanon, and he would keep him in his house until they worked on papers for them to travel outside of the Middle East, outside of Lebanon, to Israel, or I, I don't know the exact story. Unfortunately, the person who knows the story 
passed on. Uh, but there were very similar stories uh, ongoing in Lebanon, especially in, um, um, in law enforcement. Lebanese law enforcement. A lot of people in law enforcement, like my grandfather, were involved in, in uh, the smuggling of Syrian Jews. And Syrian Jews at the time were essentially un under the Ba'ath uh, Arab nationalist party's rule were prevented from leaving, uh, from leaving Syria. So um, you could say uh, that I came of age alongside what may be termed Near Eastern uh, refusals. Um, and so I have uh, become personally and intellectually in later years invested in, in the story of Near Eastern minorities and more recently the story of Near Eastern uh, uh, Jews. So I may, after all, not be such an unnatural choice to, uh, to present this symposium. And Professor Schreier didn't know this story. So, um, so I, and, and I, you know, uh, I, I thought it was it was a spot on uh, choice. Um, I must add also that uh, throughout my years at Boston College, I've also come to know and admire Dr. Shreya Petrov's work um, through the lens and the pen of his son and translator, uh, Professor Shreya. To me, as as a father myself, who has had a troubled, troubled relationship with, with my own father. I think there isn't a more exquisite, a more lovingly filial recognition of uh, one's father than acknowledging uh, their work and valorizing uh, their contributions in the way that Professor Schreier does uh, his own father. So I congratulate myself uh, for knowing you both and uh, your story really and your relationship uh, inspires me. Uh, Dr. David Schreier Petrov is an acclaimed author and uh, medical scientist. Uh, he was born in 1936 in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and debuted as a poet uh, in the late 1950s. After graduating from uh, medical school in 1959, Dr. Schreier Petrov served as a military a physician in Belarus before returning to Leningrad to pursue both literature and medicine. Um, <clears throat> I should open a parenthesis here and say that I have uh, one of my maternal uncles uh, who is a professor of medicine who studied actually at the University of Moscow uh, is also a, uh, a renowned um, uh, published author in, in, in Lebanon. So it must be a Russian thing. Uh, medical doctors, you know, <laughs> bridging bridging the humanities and, and the science, humanism and, and science. Um, Dr. David Shreya Petrov married uh, the philologist and translator uh, Emilia Schreier, nee Poliak, in 1962, uh, and moved to his wife's native Moscow in 1964. There he published a uh, collection of poetry, many literary translations, and two books of essays in the 1960s and uh, 1970s. Exploration of uh, Jewish themes put Dr. Shreya Petrov in conflict with the Soviet authorities, limiting publication of his work, and prompting him to uh, emigrate. The Jewish refusenik between 1979 and 1987, Dr. Petrov, uh, Dr. Shreya Petrov lived as an outcast in his native uh, country, but continued to write prolifically despite expulsion from the Soviet Writers' Union and persecution by the KGB. He was finally allowed to emigrate in 1987, settling in Providence, Rhode Island, where he was able to continue his academic work as a cancer researcher on the faculty of the Brown University Medical School. Since emigrating, Dr. Schreier Petrov has published 12 books of poetry, 10 novels, six collections of short stories, and four volumes of memoirs in his native Russian. Dr. Levitin and May You Be Cursed, Don't Die, be in volumes one and two of Shreya Petrov's trilogy about the exodus of Jews from the Soviet Union, 
were written between 1979 and 1984 in Moscow and smuggled to the West. An incomplete edition of the first volume of the trilogy was published in Israel in 1986, and the first complete edition of volumes one and two came out in post-Soviet Moscow in 1992 and listed for the Russian Booker Prize. Two other editions of the volume one and two of the trilogy have appeared in Russia in 2006 and 2014. Three other volumes of Shreya Petrov's fiction have appeared in English translation, Jonah and Sarah, Jewish Stories of Russia and America in 2003, Autumn in Yalta, a novel and three stories in 2006, and Dinner with Stalin and Other Stories, 2014, all of them edited by his son, Professor Maxim Shreya. Shreya Petrov's works have been listed for a number of other literary prizes and translated into 10 foreign languages. Now retired from research, Dr. Shreya Petrov lives in Brookline uh, with his wife of over 50 years, Amelia Schreier, and he devotes himself to full-time writing. Jews and Russians are, quote, the two peoples who are the closest to me in my flesh, genes, and spirit language, end quote. Shreya Petrov wrote in 1985, less than two years before emigrating from Russia. In a 2014 interview, Shreya Petrov commented on his experience as an immigrant writer, quote, most of my recent stories fashion Russian, Jewish Russian characters living in America. In the sense, I've become an American writer. I think that I've rooted myself in New England. It has become my second, now my main habitat, end quote. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shrey Petrov. Um, I'm not... I'm sure that 
it was the same when Jews came from Europe to Russia, they started form around the Yiddish, the new language. And after two generations, they started to write Russian poems, like Mandelstam, Pasternak. But with the absolutely clear features of Jewishness. Uh, this novel was started in the very unusual situation. In Moscow, that period, the end of the 70s, Lee used to live famous professor, I will name him N, because he, I will, you will understand why. So he was a refugee nine years, and his son was killed in Afghanistan. His wife was in prison for activity. And he was absolutely broke down, absolutely. And I wanted to help something. What can I do? Go to the street and make demonstration. We did it and we were many times pushed inside the jails. But the only what I could do to write about the people like him, like this former professor, refused me. And when I wrote it and gave him to read before I will send the broad to publish on the ground, he read it and he became absolutely paralyzed because he understood that all his life, previous life, he hated Soviet government, he hated Central Committee of Party, they destroyed his family, they destroyed Jewish people who continue to be his friends. And I understood that I have to write novel which defend our, us, refugees, Jewish refugees, from KGB, from all suppressing powers. So anyway, this writing was spread in the manuscript between the refugees and in 1986 it was started to publish in Israel. Translation about, about what we will talk today, it's different translation. It was translated into English by a very talented writers. And they had a lot of time to make it high professional. I want to say big, big Thank you very much, my translators. And especially, I want to say thank you to my wife, which did not take part, take part in this particular book, but she was every day with me, and she read after me all pages of manuscripts. 
we started with my wife very long ago in 62 he, and translated even Robert Frost, Byron, and some <coughs> Anglo languages. Po 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 poems and prose. I hope that my novel will be alive long, long years. And I want you to see in each part of my novel my words from my heart to your heart and thanks again to translators and friends thank you very much also I wish you to take pleasure today on the reading thank you Doctor, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly uh, introduce uh, our first panel. Uh, our first panelist um, is Professor Brian Horowitz. Uh, professor Horowitz is Sizzler Family Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor of Russian at Tulane University, a leading cultural historian of Russian Jewry. Professor Horowitz has published extensively on Russia's 19th and 20th centuries. His books include The Myth of Alexander Pushkin in Russia's Silver Age, M. O. Gershenson's Pushkinist, Jewish Philanthropy and Enlightenment in Late Tsarist Russia, Empire Jews, Jewish Nationalism and Acculturation in 19th and Early 20th Century Russia, and most recently, the Russian Jewish tradition, intellectuals, historians, and revolutionaries. Uh, the title of Professor Horowitz's talk is Jewish Souls, Russian Spirits, Loyalty and Identity in Dr. Levitin and Russian Literature. Uh, our next panel, I'm going to do both this way in, in the interest of time, and, um, and our uh, second uh, panelist uh, is Mr. Joshua Rubenstein. He is Associate Director for Major Gifts at the Harvard Law School and a longtime associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Uh, working as an independent scholar, Mr. Rubenstein is the author of many books, uh, among them Soviet Dissidents, Their Struggle for Human Rights and Tangled Loyalties, The Life and Times of Ilya Ehrenberg, and he is the co-editor of Stalin's Secret Pogrom, the post-war in, uh, post inquisition of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. Mr. Rubenstein contributed a biography of Leon Trotsky to the Jewish Live series at Yale University Press, and his most recent book is The Last Days of Stalin. The title of Mr. Rubenstein's talk today is Dr. Levitin, Soviet Jews, and the thirst for vengeance. Thank you. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, um, Dr. Shari Patrol. Thank you, Maxime. Shari Patrol. Um, I haven't been called a, a reader since I left Russia. I would say I actually quite like the term. In Russia, it's very normal. Chitatskizal, 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 so to be called a writer, I'm sorry, a reader, I haven't been called a reader in a long time. I like the, the, the term, I'm a reader, and I'm proud of it. I think everyone probably in this room wants to read, you wouldn't be here. So uh, it's a great term. I think I'll, I'll start using it um, in, uh, in the future. Hey, readers. Uh, <clears throat> so Dr. Levitin belongs to the Russian literary tradition in three main ways. The plot takes place in Moscow, and its subject is a historical portrait of a refusing. More, more Russian than that. It deals with the problem of the individual and society, the Soviet, and treats the subject of literary doubles, so famously portrayed by Galyat, 
by uh, Galyatkin and Dostoevsky's by me, the double. So it's all Russian there. The fabula, the fabula, 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 tells us about a happy man, a Jewish intellectual, a doctor, a professor, Herbert Anatolyevich Levitin, who, as the story begins, is in the middle of his life at, at point A. He will arrive at point B very much changed. Levitin will come to realize that his brilliance, his brilliance, his erudition, his diligence give him little, little advantage in the game of emigration from Soviet Russia. Once Levitin announces his desire to leave, he and his family will be vulnerable in ways they could not have imagined. Regarding point A, despite what Americans believe, in many cases, Homo Sabeticus was happy. Right? He, she, had many things that some of us lack in the United States. For instance, he had a fine and creative job in an, a nice apartment in the capital city, a beautiful and loving wife, Tatyana, and a healthy and talented son, Anatoly. However, the author predicts the coming storm, quote, Moscow Jews had already been awakened by the wave of Jewish emigration rolling in from the provinces, yet this ever-growing wave had somehow passed Dr. Levitin and his family. They had a good life, and Dr. Levitin rejected the herd mentality in both social and scientific affairs, end quote. Ostensibly, he wants to save his son from the war in Afghanistan, but in time, we, the reader, understand that there is more to it. Herbert Anatolyevich cannot exist without individual dignity, and that is a rare commodity in Soviet Russia. The plot begins in media's rest in 1979, and we might stop here for a moment and remember that Jews and Russians did not meet for the first time in that year. Rather, they had a long, and from the Jewish point of view, a rather conflicted and painful history. In contrast with fearful precedents, the late Brezhnev era doesn't seem particularly tragic. Anti-Semitism is real, but one can navigate it. Earlier repressions in Prague and Warsaw, Warsaw repel any humanist. But perhaps the Soviet Union does a measure of good in Cuba, Africa, and parts of Asia. The quotidian isn't all that bad. There's some food in the stores. Uh, astronauts flying around on rockets. And while Moscow cannot afford a Parisian lifestyle, it beats Khabarovsk in the East by a long shot. Dr. Levitin is an unexpected refusenik, and not just because he's done well, not belonging to the party, he's an educated and sensitive person who realizes that life on the other side is not so, is no picnic. The West has its own pitfalls, such as minimum wage jobs. So who doesn't know about that? Nostalgia is also, is also real, <coughs> if only for the Russian language. Humiliation plays a large role in motivating the plot, motivating the plot. Dr. Levitin is insulted that he does not have enough blot, protection, or connections to exempt his son from the army. Pride might be unintelligible to many, but to us academics, it is completely clear. Do we belong to the elite or not? And if we do, then we need concrete evidence, salary raises, such as an ability to get things others do not get. If we are not part of the elite, we need to go elsewhere because people like Levitin treat your heart palpitations and give you another 10 years. If that's important to you, give the Levitins what they want. Who is Levitin? Jews can leave the Soviet Union, but Herbert Anatolyevich is foreign to the sternly religious Jew of Tashkent or the maniacal Zionist from Berdichev. He is far from a Parishnikov or a Brodsky. There's no mob pen writers petitioning on his behalf. Dr. Levitin is the proverbial Soviet Jew, a relatively well-adjusted Jew of talent, creativity, wit, and education. But he's reached middle age at the wrong time. Brezhnev's Russia has settled into stagnancy and doesn't feel the need to, re to reward those people. Big themes, emerge in, uh, uh, big themes in the novel emerge from the question of identity. Who is a Jew? In what way is Dr. Levitin Jewish? His wife, Tatyana, is ethnically Russian. Their son could not have a religious education. Anyway, Dr. Levitin is a university man, a medical doctor. He is loyal above all to knowledge, reason, and hard work. His ideals, justice, free expression, talent, and tolerance, 
might seem Jewish, but they are the ordinary values of any inter uh, urban intelligentsia in the West. But as occurs so often in life, the stereotype is accurate. He's Jewish. And being Jewish means he can apply for immigration. The Russians, who are they? Hardly monolithic, they range from the feckless professor boss in the medical school to the surly officials in the OBR, the visa office, to the rude KGB agents who come with unpleasant truths. They appeal to his reason, quote, a struggle against the state is futile. How will it end? How will you cope with the loss of income and prestige? How will your kids cope? Do the benefits really outweigh the costs? We think, as we read it, we know how the story will end. Refuseniks bump against, against many surprises, but few of those details matter in comparison with the final result. Some Jews get a green light to leave, but others, for others, it's shades of bad, worse, and still worse. There is no middle ground to apply for a visa, excuse me, to apply for an exit visa means you must cut yourself off entirely. Normal life becomes a prison as the real life is in the future somewhere that you cannot reach. Try up the throat depicts this new consciousness with precision. One feels an absence of explanation rather than its presence. So here's a scene, you might remember, in the uh, final meeting with colleagues at the Levitian home. Quote, they sat there a bit longer. Some sort of a spring that had previously held together their relationship had snapped. Now, neither shared academic interest nor a table set for a celebration could hold them together. That is why in the hallway they were talking in a forced, unnatural way, as though they were escorting their guests out rather than seeing them off. This unnaturalness was in totally natural. That is, it was at the very core of the Levitin family predicament, and Herbert and Anatolyevich's colleagues saw it, and they weren't upset with him. Herbert and Anatolyevich stood there, lost in his thoughts, saying goodbye to Semyon Antipov and Ali Volkovich, telling them that they should come again without waiting for special invitation. And they promised to stop by soon and kiss him goodbye. And though all this they understood, and throughout, or though, and, and through all this, they understood that if there should be an occasion to see each other, it would be an unusual occasion, a difficult one, because the normal, natural course of life was forever taking them in different directions. The break with colleagues is the first break that will lead to the catastrophe. Much of the novel is a description of the descent from place A to place B. Like anyone in this situation, Levitin is not prepared or trained for self-destruction. He never contemplated what it would mean to focus all his energies in a single battle with the state. In time, he's beaten into, into despair. Shreya, Shreya Petrov conveys the pain that resides in his protagonist cranium. See? <clears throat> Quote. This appeals office was, as Herbert and Tolovich reckoned, the last available option, the final line, a dead zone separating the real life for which he had prepared himself as well as he knew how, and a life controlled by dark, otherworldly powers. The feeling totally crushed, Herbert Anatolyevich sat there for two or three hours, talking to no one and taking no interest in what Dudko and Anishkina said to those who already had their interviews. He had come to a final realization that one could draw no analogies and find no com common patterns between so-called <coughs> real life and the will of dark, secret power. <coughs> this had nothing to do with the laws of natural sciences or social sciences. No cruel truth of logic here, nor crafty truth of philosophy. Even religious religiosity, a belief in the supernatural, idealism, and pantheism as its extreme version, representing an indifference to the individual fates of the human species, any forms of worshipping of a united idea were alien and foreign to this bacchanalia of principles and deeds. Wow, that's nice. Even the implacable doctrine of monotheism or the childish nimbleness of pagan beliefs was closer to the human soul and at least erected temples for communicating with the gods. None of this could in any way be compared to the surrogates of ethics, law, and justice created in the image of the appeals office. Levitin's brilliance, 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 brilliance offers no consolation. When a chance circumstance, misspelling, or a misconstrued document causes the rejection of a visa, the wisdom of the centuries evaporates. However, the absence of practical logic transforms Levitin. He becomes one 
with the hundreds who wait endlessly in state offices in long lines, uh, ostensibly to appeal their applications, but perhaps to ask for absolution or for self flagellation. Shriya Petrov conveys pearls of life experience. For example, the adage, no matter how little you have, there's still more to lose. A large part of the novel is devoted to the building up the love story of Anatoly, Levitin's son, and his girlfriend, Natasha. Their love exists to be shattered. Levitin's son is killed in Afghanistan. Levitin himself attempts murder by fire. Tatiana, Levitin's wife, will betray him by sleeping with her old village sweetheart, who gave, uh, he, he gave her hope that he, she, he could save Anatoly from army service. Is there a genre called the Refusenik novel with its own genre conventions? Maybe. This one has three different endings. One is Levitin's demise. Levitin starts a fire where he throws petrol on an old woman clerk and her files. The narrator remarks, Herbert Anatolievich's last sensation was the joy of revenge. Not stealing your thunder there. <laughs> revenge. In other words, he extinguished himself. Another ending is the demise of the entire family. Shriya Petrov draws on Psalm 22, quote, Dogs surround me, a pack of evil ones closes in on me like lions. They maul my hands and feet. The last ending mocks Levitin and his fate. His son's girlfriend, Natasha, pregnant with Anatoly's baby, agrees to marry an older man, an American academic, Stanley Fisher. She alone the daughter of an ethnically Russian woman and a Jewish man gets to leave Russia. The only one, the daughter of an ethnically Russian man, a Jew, wait, uh, of an ethnically Russian woman and a Jewish man gets to leave Russia for good. Quote, Stanley Fisher was returning home to the United States with his young wife. So Anatoly's been killed, right? So, yeah. uh, the customs officials treated Natasha with utmost politeness and her filled out figure even freed her from a private examination in a gynecology chair. Stanley was a bit nervous, which is totally understandable. If we recall all the events of this difficult year, there were plenty of reasons for worry. Up to the last moment, they announced boarding. Then, for the last time, Natasha looked at her parents and followed her husband onto the airplane. Me, let me say, Mr., or should I say Dr. David Tria Petrov, I accuse you. Jacques, you are cruel to your protagonist. I have no any way. <laughs> All right. Although, although I think I thought through. Natasha is bringing Anatoly's baby to the United States, and the Levitin DNA will survive in the land of liberty to grow up and have more Levitins, albeit, albeit with the name Fisher. So I ask you, audience, readers, What's really most important, your DNA or your last name? <laughs> I don't know. Given choice. If we want to put Dr. Levitin in its literary context, what is that context? Russian emigrate literature. I detect common strains with Shreya Petrov's medical school classmate, the writer Vasily Aksyonov, in his novel Ajok, Burn. I see similarities with the chatty narratives of Vladimir Voinovich, or the stylized narratives of the stories of uh, Sergei Davlatov. Dr. Levitin has common elements with these and other, especially on the thematic plane of criticism of the Soviet Union. Incidentally, I, a lot of people see Kafka here, I see more of Gogol's Norse, the gnomes, than the Kafka stories. Schreier Petrov has a sympathetic contempt for his hero. as a nuance I don't see in Kafka. Although the protagonist's long learning curve about his plight reminds one of Dashros, the castle. The story of the family ruined, that's more like American writing. Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, or Albie's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and uh, you know, at the university like this, I'm sure people are thinking five or 10 other possible uh, connections. If the title includes doctor and is set in the Soviet period, a comparison with Dr. Zhivago is unavoidable. The connection is underscored by the theme of individuality and dignity. Both doctors are at odds with their epoch and the repressive state because of their values, which represent bourgeois humanism. However, whereas the last name of the doctor, Yuri Zhivago, associates 
the Pasternak's protagonist with Jiv, Jizen, life, Yvitin is linked to Liev, Russian for lion, or maybe Levite, the priestly Jewish uh, uh, tribe, or maybe Levantine, as we got in the beginning here. Uh, the area of the Eastern Mediterranean where Eretz Israel is located. In any case, his last name marks him as a Jew and a Judean. The Jewish dimension, a relatively small point at, at, at a small issue at point A, grows larger and larger. Here is how the author describes the beating when Anatoly comes to share that he has been drafted into the army and his girlfriend is pregnant. Quote, Anatoly came home and immediately went to see his father, Herbert Anatolyevich, who had lost more weight and become even more spook, was sitting over his books with the look of a tzaddik withdrawn from this world. No translation there, a tzaddik. Uh, misery makes the Vitin appear more Jewish, Jewish. The narrator's Jewish identity hasn't been a secret. The narrator's Jewish identity hasn't been a secret, but the next passage underscores it. Notice that use of Erleg Tereda, who studies literature in this room, a lot of people. Erleg Tereda, sometimes quote, translated as quasi-indirect speech or Kafka's experience speech. Uh, so it might be the narrator or Levitin who's speaking through the narrator. It's not clear. Quote, when the Germans broke into the house of my maternal grandfather, an old rabbi, he was reading the sacred books. A talis draped over his shoulders, swaying and rocking like a Bedouin, nomad between a camel's pumps. A no Bedouin nomad reading a sacred book of the desert with verses of the oasis, rhymes of water springs and refrains of sand dunes. The Germans shot the old rabbis and stomped on and buried the sacred books. The Holocaust, waiting in the wings, was bound to appear, but it has only a small, it has only a cameo role here and an earlier reference to the Eichmann trial. The central focus remains Herbert Anatolievich. Historical writing, okay, left out. historical fiction is a tricky thing. It's neither historically accurate nor entirely fictional. But it offers something that historical exposition cannot give, the true to life experience of a consciousness. What's it like to be a Russian Jew circa the Moscow Olympics of 1980? The history of the Brezhnev era Jew has not been treated with the same frequency as Lenin's or Stalin's Jews. I understand that Herbert Anatolievich is not identical with Shreya Petrov, but as a game of sorts, let's concede that they are doubles. Now, let us turn to the life text. I recall from David Shreya Petrov's autographically shot novel, Strange Danyarayev, how during World War II, he was taken as a child from his Leningrad apartment and spent formative wartime years in a remote village in the Ural Mountains, while his father fought the Nazis on the, on the war front. Their Jewish identity meant little, although his black hair and swarthy skin marked him as different. But like everyone else, the Shreya Petros bought a piglet, battened her up during the summer to slaughter for meat in the fall. The young Shreya Petrov and his mother returned to Leningrad in, 19, in the spring of 1944 after the siege was lifted. He made friends with the local riffraff, the bombed out buildings made an exciting terrain for adventure and fantasy. The doctor's plot, 52, 53, 52 and 52, created anxiety for his parents, but they weathered it, as did Shreya Petrov, who was a senior in high school as the country's Jews feared the worst. As I imagine it, Schreier Petrov went to medical school and entered the literary scene during the early Khrushchev years. He was galvanized by the thaw. The information that dribbled out about the Soviet past awakened hopes that change was approaching. When Brezhnev consolidated control in 1964, Schreier Petrov was already a young medical scientist and professional writer. Like most of the liberal Soviet intelligentsia, he had too much to lose to make a public scene of the invasion of Czechoslovakia, but he and his friends gave the SSSR a tongue lashing in their kitchens. Although the timing doesn't work out perfectly, the thought of keeping his son Maxim out of the army service, out of army service in the future, probably pro propelled his desire to emigrate when he and his wife first submitted their application in 1979. In contrast with Levitin, Shreya Petrov survived 
the Fusion and Crucible, and eventually emigrated. He has had a wonderful career, already mentioned, in the United States as a scientist and a writer. His son, Maxim, didn't die in Afghanistan, but came to America with a native speaker as Russian, and has also, also achieved a great deal in that little plot of land that we call Slavic Studies. Nonetheless, and I only have one page left, so you, if you're tired of me, you're, you're, you're on your way. Nevertheless, I would like to speculate, why does an author choose as his protagonist failures, suicides, and arsonists? I'm not sure that this is a Russian affectation, but it certainly occurs among Russia's best writers. Take Tolstoy's Poznishev from the Kreutz Sonata. Poznishev articulates some of Tolstoy's ideas about sexuality and abstinence, but in a di distorted and absurd form. Nabokov liked that game too. The Russian protagonist in his such novels as Pinin or Zashit Illusion, or Illusion's Defense, are prosaic and even shabby in comparison with their multi-talented creator. In fact, one of the gimmicks of those novels is is that the author is linguistically light years ahead of his characters. The same is true for Shreya Petrov. Levitin has many of Shreya Petrov's talents, but not all of them. He lacks the creative, or the creative's literary talent, and in that talent, or my reading of it, makes all the difference between the man who buckles under the pressure of Akkaz, refusal, and one who endures yet another day uh, to live and ultimately leave the Soviet Union. Of course, many people without literary talent left Russia, but the intellectual refusenik, an individual imbued with dignity and pride, suffered acute pain. That is why, that is clear from the novel, is pain the pain. Uh, literary skills belong to the creator, David Shreya Petrov, who sits with us today and not his literary double. On the question of liter literature and life, as we say in Hebrew, Lachaim <coughs> Gaspadin. Shreya Petrov. Oh. Thank you very much. Yeah. You gave me more than I... the driving force of the novel Dr. Levitin. During World War II, after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, Red Army mobilized in very difficult defense. Initially, the country was overwhelmed by the German invasion. It wasn't until February 1943 at the victory at Stalingrad on the bank of the Volga in the Urals, thousands of miles from where the Germans initiated their attack, that the, one could say, the end of the beginning uh, took place. Jews played a prominent role on the Soviet side of the conflict. There are hundreds of Jewish generals and admirals the leading journalists in the country were rallying the, rallying the population, both at the front and in the cities, were Ilya Ehrenberg and Vasily Grossman. The leading figure who reported to the, who monitored the, so the Western press in Moscow and had the job of responding to ugly words from Goebbels in Berlin was Solomon Abramovich Lazovsky whose family regarded themselves as the descendants of Spartac Jews who had been forced out of Spain by Torquemada in 1492 during the Spanish Inquisition. Jews were inventors of armaments on the Soviet side. And as I mentioned the Battle of Stalingrad, when General Paulus on the German side surrendered, he surrendered to a Soviet Jewish officer in a bunker at Stalingrad. I handed out a sheet of uh, two-sided paper. This is an article that Ilya Ehrenberg published in the most important newspaper in the Soviet Union during World War II, Krasnaya's is the Red Star. 
This was the paper read by the troops. Ehrenberg was, of course, Jewish himself. He lost family members in Kiev to the Germans. Two sisters of his, or uh, one sister disappeared during the German occupation of Paris. Two sisters survived there under difficult circumstances. He also lost his son-in-law at the front in that first summer of 1941. His son-in-law, Boris Lapin, was a journalist for Red Star who was caught in a German encirclement. Now, Ehrenberg's principal job during the war was to convince the Soviet population to hate the Germans because he understood that the population was not prepared for who these Germans were. But they remembered the Germans they had fought in World War I, another civilized people like the Russians caught in a tragic conflict. But Ehrenberg had seen the fascists in Spain and he witnessed the German occupation in Paris in the summer of 1940 before returning to Moscow. And he understood that, the, the, that his people, the Soviet people, were not facing Germans. They were facing Nazis. They were not facing another culture, civilized people. They were, for, they were facing beasts. In order to fight them and defeat them, they would have to hate them. So Ehrenberg wrote these articles, about 2,000 articles in the Soviet press, during a period of four years, whose principal theme, which he repeated again and again and again, was in order to defeat the Germans, you must hate them. If you kill one German, kill more Germans. Not a day should go by that you don't kill a German. Now, the second theme of his writing was the fate of the Jews. There is a well widespread belief that the Soviet press, the Soviet media, ignored the plight of the Jews during World War II. This is simply not true. The coverage in the Soviet press of what we now came, what came to be called the Holocaust, and specifically the massacres of Soviet Jews and, so and German occupied Soviet territory, was inconsistently covered, and certainly did not reach the, the dimension that it deserved, given that these were Soviet citizens. Of the six million Jews who perished, we now believe that about two and a half million were Jews living in German-occupied Soviet territory on the eve of the invasion in June 1941. This is an astonishing proportion of all the Jews who killed, were killed. And most of them were killed in open-air massacres. Unlike the Jews of Western Europe and Central Europe, the victims were not brought to the killers at Auschwitz and Treblinka. On Soviet territory, the killers descended on the victims, the way locusts descend on a wheat field. Now, Ehrenberg was aware that when the Germans invaded, there was this widespread myth, fueled by anti-Semitism, that the Jews were not fighting. That while Ivan, a Russian name, while Ivan is at the front, Abram is in Tashkent. Abram is kind of relaxing, avoiding service, avoiding danger. In fact, about 450,000 Jewish soldiers fought in the Red Army. And we now believe about 200,000 of them fell in battle. And Ehrenberg was very well aware of that and featured this in an article which he published in Red Star in November 1942. Now I want to call that date to your attention. The Battle of Stalingrad began that fall and was one of the initial turning points in all of the war. And so at that moment, that crucial moment, he published this article, which got a tremendous amount of attention, focusing on a handful of Jewish soldiers who distinguished themselves, brought the, their faith was brought to his attention. They were in medals. Some fell in battle. Others were wounded and survived. But he made a point of saying, of course, the Jews are fighting, and they're dying alongside their Russian and Ukrainian, Belarusian and uh, Armenian comrades from all the different na nationalities of the Soviet Union. And his principal theme was, of course, that not only are they fighting as Soviet patriots, but they're fighting as Jews. And they're taking revenge for all these Jewish victims, including many of their own families. So this theme of Jewish revenge against anti-Semitism, against murderous anti-Semitism, is something that played a prominent role in Soviet propaganda during World War II, as exemplified, of course, by Ehrenberg, who was, without question, 
the most influential journalist on the Eastern Front, and in my view, the most influential journalist in all of World War II on any front. Now, what's curious to me when I was reading Dr. Levitin is that it's the third novel I've read in recent years about Soviet Jews taking revenge. And I don't think that any of the authors were aware of the other two as they were writing their book. One book I'll bring to your attention was written by a gentleman here in Newton, just, who lives just blocks from us here, named Neville Frankel. Neville was born in South Africa and emigrated to the United States, where he had a career in the financial industry. But he likes writing. He likes painting. So a couple of years ago, he published a book on the sickle's edge, which tells the story not so much of a refusing family, but of a Soviet Jewish family that's cut off from its Western relatives because of the dislocations associated with World War I and after, and Stalinism. And they go through many of the trials and tribulations of Soviet Jews, of World War II, of fighting and surviving. And then there's the Khrushchev period and the thaw, and a young woman who's raised in the Soviet, uh, in the Soviet Union becomes a believing Soviet citizen, has an affair with an important Soviet bureaucrat, and then realizes what a monster he is. And one of the characters in the book is her grandmother, who likes to spoil this outrageous, abusive Soviet bureaucrat by making ice cream. And he's devoted to her ice cream. And the final climax of the novel, when she finally realizes that it's up to her to kill him, she mixes shards of glass into the ice cream, which she hungrily devours and dies a gruesome death. This is the climax to the novel, uh, where this elderly Jewish woman, to save her granddaughter, carries out revenge against this loathsome Soviet bureaucrat. And then a couple of years ago, Paul Goldberg, who's another emigrate from Moscow and lives in Washington today, published his first novel called the Yid. And the Yid takes place in Moscow in the early 1950s, in the midst of Stalin's final years, and specifically the final months of his life, when in January 53, the regime announces that it has exposed a nefarious, terrible plot led by Jewish doctors in league with Zionists and imperialists, meaning the Americans to undermine the health of Soviet leaders, including Stalin, and kill them maliciously using their medical knowledge. This is the doctor's plot that Brian already alluded to. The doctor's plot was in the works quietly for several months, but it was announced on January 13th. And for the next five weeks, the Soviet press was filled with caricatures and articles, editorials denouncing Zionism, denouncing the Jewish doctors, and causing great panic throughout society. Jewish doctors were under deep suspicion. We know now that patients wouldn't take their medicine unless the doctors swallowed the pills first. People were being fired from their jobs. And this engendered a deep fear that Soviet Jews would face the, would face the destiny of the Crimean Tatars and others who had been deported en masse from their homelands within Soviet territory to Central Asia, to Birobidjan, the fake Jewish homeland in Soviet territory, or Central Asia, somewhere remote. No one knows for sure what Stalin's ultimate intentions were for the doctor's plot. No single document has ever been discovered confirming a plot to actually deport Soviet Jews en masse, or particularly from the Western the European countries, of cities of Russia, Leningrad, Moscow, Riga, Vilna, etc., where there were large Jewish populations to Central Asia. But there was something was afoot that was so frightening and terrifying to the Soviet Jews. In the midst of this historical event, a group of actors, Yiddish actors, avoid arrest and come up with a plot to kill Stalin. At the very end of the novel, The Yid, which was widely reviewed and uh, very favorably, favorably reviewed a couple of years ago, they succeed in infiltrating the Kremlin and killing Stalin himself. What better fantasy for a Soviet Jew at that moment than to imagine 
killing Stalin. Now, Stalin actually collapsed on March 1st, which in 1953 was the, was the holiday of Purim. In Purim, we celebrate at this time of year, in February, March, depending on the Jewish calendar, where there's a plot to attack almost the Jews of Persia, led by King Ahasuerus. And that plot is thwarted by Mordechai and the queen, Queen Esther, who's obviously a Jewish woman, but the king doesn't realize that he's chosen a, a Jewish woman to be his bride. And they intervene and heroically stop the villain Haman. And he himself is executed, and the Jews take revenge on their enemies. And this story is told in the book of Esther in the Bible. Quintessential story of Jewish revenge. So now we have Dr. Levitin, the third book in this trilogy of Jewish revenge. And this one relates to a far more familiar story. Many of us have come to know in recent years. Talking to our emigre friends, some of whom experienced the very difficult, dislocating experience of being refusings, of becoming not just second-class second citizens, but fifth-class citizens in the Soviet Union, not being able to work, not being able to pursue their professions, being hounded, and never knowing when the moment might come that, in fact, they would be allowed to leave. And many eventually were allowed to leave before Brezhnev died, even before Gorbachev came to power until 86 and 87, when the gates really did open and those who had been waiting finally got the opportunity to come to the West or go to Israel or Australia or Germany, wherever more or less they wished to emigrate. And this novel concludes with a very graphic scene of revenge where the hero, Dr. Levitin, <coughs> finally comes up with a plot the me a method, a means to attack a woman, a bureaucrat, running, a, helping to run the visa office, who's making life miserable for these refusing Jewish families. At the very end of the book, like the soldiers who threw themselves on German tanks, he not only succeeds in killing this woman and destroying her stock of card files, which was part of her method for targeting these Jewish refusniks, but he sacrifices himself. And when she sees him approach her and feels the terror in her own heart of what might be about to happen, what does she say to him? What, is the, what does the novelist say? She was so certain that her visitor was indecisive and docile, like most members of the intelligentsia, intelligentsia that she didn't even try to fly out and escape from the pharmacy. She worked in a, a drug a drugstore. And of course, this image of the docile, effeminate intellectual, Jewish intellectual, is what Ehrenberg himself was playing off in the portrait which I handed out to you earlier. Because who are these soldiers? One is a philologist. One is a literary student. Not someone who was schooled in the street, not someone who's street smart, but somehow in a profession with weak, effeminate hands. And yet, the war gave them the opportunity and the need to go to the front. So there is a continuum here between what Ehrenberg was writing and the mood he picked up on and celebrated uh, during World War II, which is a real uh, crisis that they all felt and had experienced, <coughs> and what these three subsequent novels, including Dr. Levitin, so vividly captured um, in their books. I want to assure you not all Russian Jews or Soviet Jews come away from the Soviet Union with a thirst for revenge. Because the, the experience of, of growing up, not only within Soviet society, but within Russian culture, was so overwhelming, was so internalized, that the experience uh, provokes a great deal of ambivalence as well, which is hatred toward the regime and love for the people and love for the culture. And you, that all has to be taken into account uh, when you read these novels, when you think about the need for revenge, and what prompted that. So I think that's all we need to think about when we celebrate uh, the publication of this wonderful novel. Thank you. Thank you.
um, have just about uh, six minutes for questions um, before we break briefly for uh, the book signing and uh, reception. Um, so, uh, also as, as the master of time, in the interest of, of time, maybe we should take a couple of questions and uh, leave the panelists to pick and choose. Uh, so please. Just speak up. Questions, objections, comments? Suicide at the same time. Sure, sure. Um, so how how common is this in Jewish tradition? I mean, in in Muslim tradition, in, in Christian tradition, uh, there's no such thing. I mean, martyrdom is sort of a passive thing. In Muslim tradition, martyrdom is active. How is martyrdom uh, interpreted in, in Jewish? Tradition? Well, uh, suicide is a sin, but self-sacrifice and martyrdom in the face of the enemy uh, engenders respect. Uh, in Jewish history, the, the, uh, mass, the uh, sacrifice of the soldiers in the community of Masada in the Negev against the Roman soldiers, um, well, that's something that's celebrated. But this was passive, correct? It wasn't passive. No, that I mean, was they a, were. No, it was a war. It was war. They were under the siege. The Romans said that they were in this fortress society in, on a cliff above, above the Negev Desert. I mean, many of us have visited there. It's a very stark, beautiful landscape. But the end was there. And rather than succumb, they committed suicide. Um, is it the right decision? Should they have taken more Roman soldiers with them? I mean, I, I can't give an answer to that. The kosher is the knife, though. Well, there's one other very prominent thing that you both have worked on, if I may, which is the rise of Jewish self-defense in the Russian Empire. Well, right. And I think that has a lot to do with this in some way. Well, right. I mean, during World War One and uh, the Civil War in 1918, 1919 in the Ukraine, there were pogroms of, uh, now we estimate between 100, maybe 150,000 Jews were killed in the context of the Civil War by Ukrainian anti-Semites and white forces. And the Red Army units here and there, led by Trotsky, did try to intervene. And um, so there were some Jewish self-defense units established. But that's not revenge, that's just self-defense. Um, the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, the were Jews who rebelled and helped destroy the camp at Treblinka or Sobibor, that was not a question of, there was some revenge, but it was, it was a desperate attempt at, at, uh, at uh, saving themselves, but also to destroy the facility. Um, there was a pathetic attempt to revenge after the war. A bunch of uh, Jews took some, they, they were planning to um, poison the Roman water supply, and they were, it was so, it was so infant, um, 
amateurish. But right. You know, it's, it's and there were other attempts on uh, Nazis who survived to uh, poison them in different ways. It's groups, not just individuals. Yes, Amelia. First of all, thank you both for just incredible, incredible life given to uh, the book. Uh, wonderful, thank you. I want to a little bit disagree with uh, Joshua's interpretation, if I may. I think I can say that I am really very well familiar with both Dr. Levitin and Dr. Gerard Petro, <laughs> just by, by the book. Uh, and not that I'm against revenge, uh, I'm full of trying to be revengeful to that country after all they did to us. But I think Dr. Levitin um, is not so much revengeful. In that phantasmagorical scene that you were referring to, the very last day in the audio, it's certainly sick fantasy. And he was physically trying to, or not physically, he thought he was trying to um, destroy those files uh, of uh, Jewish refuseniks, thinking that that may be the end of it, which, of course, I understand it would be. Um, but he was not revengeful. I'm sorry, I don't quite, though it's very interesting what you said, but I don't quite agree with that. Well, we'll both have to read it again. Okay, Just the last 20 pages. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, please join us outside. We can continue the conversation outside with some questions.